Dire Wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Logos is the icon of the Father, and man is the icon of God. We are the image of God. Dire wave. Three.
Dire Wave. Three. Dire Wave 3.
jigsaw puzzle. Technology allows us to put those pieces together. What is the central bank? Not a central bank. Dire Wave 3. Dire Wave 3. Science comes out of medieval universities. This may be totally lost on modern people, but no, actually modern science comes out of universities. Guess where universities come from? Byzantium. What is the theology of Byzantium? Orthodoxy. The longest running empire, the most successful economic empire in the history of the world was Orthodox. It was Byzantium. So we give universities, we give civilization, all these things come from the treasures of orthodox so i would say that we can prove that our morals our theology is from god i'm not saying that just because of history it proves it i was just rebutting certain points that he made about history we've actually built civilizations canon law is very important in the history of law history of law theory universities come from orthodoxy so um, when we reject dialectics and dialectical tensions and the presuppositions of dialectics which are the very root of all uh, all Gnostic systems are all built on dialectical tensions and the, and the assumptions of dialectics all the way back to Plato when we reject that what's what we're left with is a unique revealed anthropology and a, a unique metaphysic a unique worldview a unique ethic that is not just in theory it's actually been proved and stamped into history in the longest empire in the world.
right, welcome. <clears throat> How are y'all doing? <clears throat> I'm still a little sick. I apologize. But we're going to have a fun time. I forgot to pull something up. Let me see. Hope y'all are doing well. We had a lot of drama last couple of days, but the good news... <coughs> The good news is that uh, everybody seems to have uh, calmed down. Oh, don't tell me I can't find this now. The good news is that, what is with this messy old blog? Where is the original? Come on now. I thought that was a PDF. Used to be. <clears throat> I'm kind of out of it. I apologize. Is it? No. So we had a lot of drama, and then um, <clears throat> the good news is that uh, so Byzantine Scotus' wife uh, said that she apologized for making her comment, which uh, that's cool. I appreciate that. The comment isn't that big of a deal. A lot of people felt like that would hurt. Uh, we're not hurt about it. It's the reality of what it is. I think. You know, we've, we've known that Jamie can't have kids. So it's not really that, uh, you know, it's not like some shocker. We didn't just learn this. Uh, we want, we knew that a while back and, uh, you know, we've always put that in God's hands anyway, so we're not worried about it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, I'm not even mad that, you know, people wanted to, you know, try to find that kind of stuff. And I made a joke about, uh, him, you know, leaving for, leaving orthodoxy for JJ or whatever. So, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I'm not hurt by those kinds of comments. I think a lot of this stuff doesn't really bother me, except that it's the, it's combined with like the really nasty, not willing to have discussions kind of stuff. And by discussions, I don't mean, will you interact? I mean, you know, knowing the material. So for example, the guy that came on yesterday, if you're giggling and laughing about the topics, why are you, why are you here to even debate it? So I think what we're going to do is, uh, I've extended a open olive branch of friendship to any of the Roman Catholics who want to, uh, let bygones be got bygones and move past all that kind of stuff. Uh, we know we disagree. We don't have to pretend, you know, that we all have the same views that we're all friends and on the same page or whatever. We, we know that we're not, so that's okay. And uh, we can, I wish I could find this freaking letter. Let me see. <laughs> Recognize uh, <clears throat> that, you know, we disagree. And it doesn't have to get into the personal stuff. And that, I don't have a problem with anybody making jokes. If you want to make jokes about uh, the way I sniff and snort because I have allergies, that's fine. Because Mario did that and I thought it was funny, right? The mock debate between me and Lofton was funny. And uh, you're more, more than welcome to do that. I don't mind the, the fake uh, fake debate that he put up. That was really funny. I shared it. It's more so the, you know, nasty stuff of really trying to undermine and go after people's wives and that kind of stuff. Like, that's the really nasty stuff. So, you know, that <laughs> if you want to make fun of me, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, but it, it's not the case that, like, we're degenerates that, you know, are trying to, like, a lot of them are acting like, oh, they're degenerates who don't want to have kids. And this is a thing that's been going around for a long time. And I, it doesn't bother me because it's just kind of silly. Anybody that knows us knows that we don't, you know, act this way. We're not, we're not crazy. We're not degens. But I will say that, like, a lot of the problems that they talk about, sure. Like, I confess, when I go to confession, I confess being <clears throat> uh, arrogant, prideful, and uh, impatient and uh lusting after women so those are my those are my main sins so it's not any of these other crazy things that they're always trying to accuse me of so those are my sins you can all know my sins i don't care they're they're typical i think uh you know guy sins so there you go now <clears throat> i personally don't think that saying uh, that a cuss word is a big deal a lot of people get really upset over this you don't have to watch my stuff you don't have to listen to me that's fine you can go about your business, um, but the like the moral uh, like one upping that's what's I think really weird and it's just bizarre to pick something like 
oh, he says the word asshole, right? And then that <clears throat> gives you this opportunity to come on the internet and display that you're morally superior because I said the word asshole. I mean, that I just think that's really weird. So to me, that suggests a lack of, you know, reality in terms of the world that we live in. Um, words aren't inherently evil. Uh, when Paul said, don't let disgusting things come out of your mouth. I mean, we saw a lot of disgusting things come out of people's mouths this week. So that applies to everybody. <clears throat> it's all, it's all just, uh, words and chatter. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Let's just let it go. And if any Roman Catholics want to be on good terms and be friends and let all that go, I'm, I'm open to do it. Here's an open olive branch. I think that for, to avoid future contentions, the way to do it is that if anybody wants to do a public debate, like a Roman Catholic, um, I'm going to have kind of a set standard of things that a person should be familiar with. And, you know, that'll be certain texts or whatever. And that's just, you know, that's my right to do that. I have the right to do that if I want to set up debates with people. And that way, it won't be a debate where somebody is just trying to play a gotcha but doesn't know the material. And I think in the case of the Q and A's, what we'll do to avoid that, because people are pulling from those too. Look how mean he is. Well, it's when a Roman Catholic comes on who wants to have a debate and is not familiar by his own admission with the literature and with the the topic, like the guy yesterday. So that was the frustrating part with me. It was if if you don't know something, then the proper approach, the topic, the material, the history of the debate, the proper approach would be to ask questions. Not to have that adversarial um, debate attitude. So that's going to be, I think, the new expectation in the future. And that way we can avoid the more like, you know, heated confrontational things. So there's still the possibility of debate. If you can display that you know the materials, then that way I avoid interacting with people that are, you know, blustering and Dunning-Kruger and arrogant and don't know the position. Right. And so <clears throat> that's the frustrating part. And then everybody knows, you know, when people like giggle and with condescension, to me, that's really um, just it displays the kind of person that I'm dealing with. So if you wonder what the things are that trigger me or get me uh, annoyed, it's that kind of stuff. It's not sticking to the topics. It's, you know, talking about my wife coming after that, that stuff is just really pitiful and, and petty. So I'm all for not knowing that if you guys want to do that. Let's stick to the issues. Um, if you want to come after me for personal reasons or sins, I'm giving you my sins. So I, I'm an arrogant person and I lust after women uh, and I am impatient. Those are the main things that I deal with. Uh, but I don't hate these people. There's no hatred in my heart. I'm not mad at the Roman Catholics. I'm not even mad at uh, Lofton and these people. And... Um, I don't think that we're at the point where we would be, uh, you know, interacting and on good terms, mainly because uh, there's kind of a, a consistent display of bad will. And so for any of the Roman Catholics who do want to be on good terms, there's an open olive branch there. And uh, I apologize to any of the Roman Catholics who are offended by the demeanor that I've had in terms of being defensive and, and uh, coming at people. <laughs> But usually that's prom that's prompted. It's not out of nowhere. Uh, you know, as we saw with the previous uh, run-ins with, uh, you know, like Lofton and Ibarra, <clears throat> that was due to years of stuff. I didn't just out of nowhere decide one day, oh, I want to go after these people. <clears throat> as everybody knows, you know, the majority of the material on my channel, probably 90 to 95% is straight up uh, issues. The content, the focus, the, the, the books, the lectures, um, probably f not even 5% is like dealing with personal uh, responses or dramas. So you can go through the thousand videos that I have and you'll notice that I can think of two Orthodox people that I've replied to, um, two critiques I've done of Bartholomew three years ago. Uh, so when it comes to the Orthodox domain, that's about it when it, when it comes to public material going at, going after or, or replying to people. And uh, two or three of those were, again, many years ago. And um, when it comes to the Roman Catholic world, uh, there have been, that I recall, personal responses. We responded to Taylor Marshall, to Lofton, to Trent Horn. 
maybe Matt Fratt. Well, kind of Matt Fratt on a couple Q and A's. Um, and then we did a couple set of a contest replies, but we didn't name anybody. So the majority of the replies to the Roman Catholics have been to the big name people. Now, yesterday we did a reply to, uh, you know, business SCOTUS and, and the people in that domain. But I would just uh, remind you guys that, you know, we just did a stream uh, with uh, Mario and Joe Boca. And both of those streams, or excuse me, that stream <clears throat> was perfectly civil. You know, there was a couple times where we had a good, passionate discussion, uh, but nobody got mad. Uh, you know, so there's the, uh, an example of a trad cat interaction. But you'll notice that Joe was good natured and wasn't interested in any kind of like, moral uh gotchas he wasn't interested in trying to trying to tear down my reputation or whatever and again I, i'm trying to stress to you guys that all that does is really make what you do look weak when it's all about you know the fact that i said something mean or made a joke five years ago it's just to me it's really it's really weak so why don't we go back to the issues and just forget all that stuff now <clears throat> like i said i don't care if you want to make jokes but there's a difference between jokes and like, you know, the really nasty stuff. Um, so that would be my request. And I appreciate the people who did uh, reach out, the Roman Catholics who did reach out and did decide that they do want to be on, on uh, good terms. So <clears throat> looking through the Twitter replies and all that, uh, most people seem pretty positive about it. I even <clears throat> reached out to one of those uh, angry women <laughs> yesterday and uh, she seemed to be uh, uh, charitable in her response. <laughs> I apologize. Like I said, I'm sick. <clears throat> You're ruining your brand. You got to be mean. No, I mean, I think that, um, from, from when, when I do the, do the jokes, like that's to me, that's not being mean. I think it's funny, right? I mean, a lot of what we do is jokes and half of YouTube is people, you know, making jokes about other YouTubers. So to me, it's just part and parcel of the game. Um, you know, when we, <clears throat> when we had blood sports, one of the good things about blood sports is that it's kind of like, even though it didn't have a good ending, blood sports was kind of like, um, an, an initiation that people should go through, <laughs> not like an occult initiation, but initiation in the sense <clears throat> of, um, you know, preparing you for getting made fun of and having hundreds and thousands of people in the comments, you know, calling you an idiot and calling you. Um, a, a goober, <laughs> right? And you know, we did that for several years and after a while, it's not a big deal, right? It's okay. So what? So there's a bunch of, uh, internet dorks that hate me. So what? And I think the people that don't go through that, they kind of, <clears throat> you, you go through this process of when you first start to grow your channel and you start to build an audience and people are really coming after you, which is going to happen to anybody. Uh, it's, it's difficult at first. A lot of people freak out about it. A lot of people can't handle it. So, um, that's why I think one of the advantages of doing the blood sports thing, uh, was that it really made you, made me at least kind of impervious to, uh, these kinds of attacks. So what am I drinking? This is <clears throat> a really good organic tea that I found that I mixed with orange juice. It's called T2. Uh, my priest recommended this or his wife did and, I'm like, in, I'm in love with this stuff. It's like the best, t no, T2 is not a sponsor, but if you're looking for the best organic, expensive tea, it's really good. So I've been loading up on, I have like a new tea brewing obsession now, <clears throat> but I also have my uh, espresso. So, so anyway, I might, I might be a little lower in it, low energy compared to what you're usually used to, but that's just cause I have a cold. Um, Let's see, what is a letter to Francis concerning his past abysmal state of pap papism? I need to find this letter because this is this is an important letter that I think <clears throat> I can't type today. And I also wanted to mention that <clears throat> Uh oh, now we're going to some crazy Greek hacker site that's going to destroy my computer. That's not it. 
Maybe we have to use this dumb site. I don't know. This is it, but I hate all these freaking ads on these sites. Like, can I not just read this document without 5,000 ads? And I don't, I don't trust this website. I'm not going to download whatever the heck that is. <laughs> All right, well, I can't find this letter anymore. It used to be at Orthodox Info. <clears throat> Surely it's... Here it is. Finally. Got it. Okay, that's what, <clears throat> that's what we want to go through here a little bit later. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different things tonight uh, in terms of uh, more geopolitical stuff. I couldn't find any Roman Catholics that wanted to come on, but that's okay. <clears throat> Somebody was suggesting this guy... Um, What's his name? Nolan Knows. Uh, which, yeah, I don't. If that guy wants to come on, he can come on. I don't care. <clears throat> Does not need sleep. Uh, I got a good night's sleep last night. I was dreaming of all the trad cats, and my heart was overflowing with love for the trad cats. I'm just joking. <clears throat> DMT. So we won't be really talking about a lot of the theological stuff tonight. As I said, we're going to be talking about the, um, the, I get distracted by everybody in the chat. <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the history of the, the geopolitical elements. We're going to kind of hit overview. We're not going to go super deep into every century and all of the, um, specifics, uh, but we will be hitting on the highlights and I'm going to kind of go through some of the, uh, important books that I've read over the years relating to this topic that, that stuck out to me and really um, helped me refine my view on this because for a long time, you know, especially when I was a traditional Catholic, you know, I have, I have my Alta Vendita and all that kind of stuff up there. And I've got all my Michael Davy stuff and all that trad stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you kind of get locked into this attitude that it's the papacy versus the forces of liberalism. And I, I bought into that for a long time. And then <clears throat> when I, read a lot more into the cold war and then got into the more recent research of people like, uh, David Wimhoff and all that, you know, that helps you refine, uh, your attitude towards this. And you realize that, uh, to use the language of Lofton, it's more nuanced than that, bro. So we're going to have a lot of nuance in charity today. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm being serious too with the open, the open offer of goodwill. Uh, there's no tricks. I don't need to engage in tricks. I think that, uh, you know, as Orthodox, we should try to always have that offer of goodwill, even if, uh, even if the people don't want to take you up on it, even if they don't want to be of goodwill, then that's their decision, right? So, but uh, if they want to uh, be on good terms, I'm open to that. And there was people suggesting, uh, uh, you know, even Taylor Marshall. Yeah, I would have a chat with Taylor Marshall. I don't think that he wants to, but if he wants to do that, uh, sure. Yeah, anybody can uh now i say anybody i don't mean like the really wild really nasty uh, individuals out there there's a few individuals that i don't want to interact with uh but for anybody else that's had kind of a you know a angry bad experience in the past that's an open open door um and and we can be we can go back to we can rewind we can hit that reset button boy not the great reset and i am tonight uh gonna be uh, respectful. I'm not going to be mean to anybody. I'm going to present these, uh, points as I understand them. And one of, you know, part of life is, uh, being able to deal with people that disagree with you. And, you know, Aristotle said famously, it is a mark of an intelligent man to understand a position without adopting it. So to all the traditional Catholics or the Roman Catholics out there that, <clears throat> you know, really take issue with the stuff we talk about, um, I would say, you know, relax, uh, you know, if you're confident in your position, you don't have anything to worry about, at least understand wh where we're coming from. And, uh, I will try my best to grant to everybody the benefit of the doubt. I will try to grant to everybody, um, the, ch the charitable interpretation in the sense of, okay, you, I can, let me understand why you, why you think this way. Right. And a lot of times I can, I can try to understand that because, you know, I was, I was a trad cat for a while. I was in that for several years. So I'm willing to try to <clears throat> put myself back in that, in those shoes and remember what that was like. So, <clears throat> you know, yesterday we covered uh, an introduction to Denny's book, <laughs> which I think is one of the, <clears throat> one of the 
the better books on <clears throat> critiquing the papacy. And today we're going to hit, as I said, the highlights of some, of some other texts that uh, get into more geopolitical stuff. Because one thing that happens, in my view, with the papacy is that it, <clears throat> it goes in the direction of, uh, of being very tied up with international geopolitics. And while it's true that the church can never be completely separated from the world, uh, I think the older uh, Orthodox model of the Byzantine Sym Symphonia and the Two-Headed Eagle um, I think that's the attitude, uh, especially of the, of the mature, um, church state views by the seventh century. That doesn't mean that I think that the doctrine evolved, but I think that the precision comes about later on in, in church history. So by the seventh council, for example, we get really, um, clear statements in the, in the seventh council about the relationship between church and state, <laughs> particularly between, <clears throat> Uh, the emperor, empress, whatever, uh, and the bishops. And so this becomes the model of the two-headed eagle of church and state being being the same body. Uh, but in my view, the that's kind of runs contrary to the papal view of uh, the, the Pope kind of being the head also of the state. And by the time of Dictatus Pope and by the time of the 11th century, 12th century, that's what we start to get. A lot of books uh, have covered this. I, I wouldn't think this is that controversial. And as everybody, I think, knows, this was backed up uh, for many years, for many centuries, from about six, 700 up to about 1,200, 1,300, until the time of Lorenzo Valla and the Renaissance. And we're going to be talking about some of those Renaissance figures. I hope I brought my Renaissance. Yeah. Um, with the advent of <clears throat> um, textual scholarship, to question a lot of things like uh, pseudo Isidorian decretals, uh, donation of Constantine, right? So those were key, many of those things were key texts that not only uh, dealt with the theological place of the Pope in the Church ecclesiastically, but also the temporal realm and the papacy having the right and the um, the authority, etc., to be above all emperors in the world, all kings in the world, and that the Pope must crown all kings in the world. And you really see this come to fruition in terms of corruption uh, with, you know, the Borgias, the Renaissance papacy, and so forth. <clears throat> so a lot of that's relevant to what we're going to talk about in, the, in an overview. And then we'll get up into the modern period um, of the, uh, not so much Jesuits per se, I might talk a little bit about that, but up into the period of uh, 20th century geopolitics and the Cold War and the relationship of John Paul II, for example, to uh, the CIA, the relationship of <clears throat> John Paul I um, and his assassination and um, the forces that might have been involved in that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Vatican Bank and the P2 Lodge and Gladio as well. I uh, found some really cool clips. Oh, I forgot this uh, excellent documentary that I recommend everybody should watch because it is pertinent we did do a live stream on this uh documentary and other films very very similar to it but i don't think people will remember um how relevant that is to tonight's topic <clears throat> so again bear with me that <clears throat> i do have a a, a cold so yeah that's it so we do want to talk about that colby documentary so <clears throat> last thing i wanted to say about the trads is that uh, as an as another sign of a gesture of goodwill that uh, i am being serious that's not some trick uh i'm gonna do a stream probably this week that'll throw a curveball at y'all boys um what about the positive aspects of traditional Catholicism and uh, Thomism. Well, did you know that I, I think there are some good points? There That not everything in Thomism is wrong or bad. Likewise, not everything <clears throat> in terms of uh, what traditional Catholics are after and believe and motivations, they're not all bad. So uh, I do want to give credit and give credence where that's due. And so I'm happy to do that uh, in a separate stream which I think will show that you know, the, the, the point here is not to uh, constantly attack everybody. And again, most of the time, that's not what we're doing. We're usually probably, like I said, 90, 95% of the time, we're dealing with the actual issues 
Um, and we're not, we're not interested in like going after people's personal, um, personal stuff every time. Yeah. Sometimes I make jokes that are personal. Sometimes I, I mention people's, uh, issues like yesterday, but for the most part, that's typically not what we do. And I want to keep it that way. So, you know, uh, I shouldn't have, uh, gotten into that level of the fray yesterday. So, uh, anyway, so I did give an apology for that. Uh, if you guys would hit like and share, uh, we're going to get <clears throat> into some really interesting stuff. That's geopolitical. <laughs> I apologize for the snorting uh, due to my cold, but there are some really neat stuff on this and I would just caution people to not um, get too upset about these topics. And I would add too that we did two, well actually more than two, at least three or four streams over the last several years that were all multi-hour streams uh, critiquing these same problems in orthodoxy. So if someone thinks that, you know, I'm not I'm not being uh, fair, like, oh, this is just a gotcha for Rome. No, there's, there are similar problems in orthodoxy, and we've done some streams on that. Uh, we talked to Metropolitan Jonah about this. We've talked to a uh, GOP longtime uh, consultant, um, civil statesman Jim Jotras. Um, we've talked to, who else did we talk to about this? Mark Hackard, uh, we did a stream about this problem. Um, in terms of Russia, we've talked about this in two streams about Bartholomew and his approach to things. So if you don't know that, or if you doubt me on that, I'm happy to tell you where that is and what I talked about. So there's one of these, and you can see that had a lot of views for, for a boring podcast five years ago, four years ago, four and a half years ago. So I'll put that in the chat. Here's one where we critique uh, this this problem in the Orthodox world. And then I'll give you another one where we did the same thing. So, uh, yeah, we, we have no problems spreading the critique to, uh, to everywhere. <laughs> it's all circles. We're... We're not selective. We're, we're an equal opportunity offender in that regard. Um, it does happen to be the case, though, that you know we spend more time, obviously, replying to the Roman Catholic view than uh, people within the Orthodox world. But, um, yeah, if anybody wants to make the argument that, well, you have this problem, too, I would totally agree. The only difference that really, I think, sets Orthodoxy apart, even in this problem, is the fact that Orthodoxy is decentralized. So if the Roman Catholic Church <clears throat> happened to be decentralized... I don't think this would be that systemic of a problem, right? It wouldn't be um, something that kind of infects the body from the head. And I think that once the papacy really wedded itself to geopolitics, that is part of what led to the, the papacy kind of being forever enmeshed in geopolitics. And in the Orthodox view, <clears throat> this is a violation of canon law. Uh, so I understand that Roman Catholics have a different canon law, and I'm well aware of that. But in terms of the first thousand years of the church, canon law forbids, for example, um, people in the state, or excuse me, people in the church being part of the state. And there's no mention in any, any of those ancient canons of an exception for the Bishop of Rome. So that means that you can't have this notion of prince bishops, right, which you do get in the Latin West. Now, if that occurred in Russia at some point, if it occurred in an Orthodox land, um, we would say that's non-canonical, right? You're not supposed to do that. And that's why there's canonical penalties for um, not just bloodshed, but, you know, priests, for example, are not supposed to be involved in warfare. Now, they might be on the battlefield to hear confessions or to bless or whatever, like you know, that makes perfect sense. But there's definitely a shift in this attitude, um, which is in... You know, it's not. I don't even think this is controversial for the role of the church to not be um, blended with or overlapping with the role of the state, and especially by the time of like the Borgias, as an example, this is where you do get the overstepping of that boundary, and the Pope clearly becomes um, a world geopolitical state leader at the same time as he is a church leader. And while I understand the Roman Catholic view that that's necessary or that it had to be or that it was pragmatic, my point is that it violates the attitude of the canons in the first seven councils slash eight 
Okay. So that's to me, a really strong argument that, um, as our caller noted last night, Yves Congar says, and after 900 years, and as a uh, Whalen notes, excuse me, Welton notes in uh, two paths, this really came to the forefront in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. You have a real shift at that time in the West and the church in the West with that early, uh, you know, middle ages, middle, middle ages, late middle ages, transformation of the papacy. That's really where we see a clear departure, uh, from the East and even the, the uniate, uh, you know, or, or, uh, Roman Catholic world admits and recognizes this too, right? You can read this in people like Francis de Bornick. So <clears throat> this transformation occurs around that time. A lot of uni at Roman Catholics will admit this, concede this. That's the concession that we get in the Yves Congar after 900 years book. And why is that? Well, a big part of this puzzle piece is precisely this idea of the papacy as a geopolitical state leader. And uh, I do want to grant to the Roman Catholics that th there's a, a there is a reason why this occurred, and it's not all completely out of greed or the fault of the Roman Catholics, right? And so, for example, I remember when I was a trad, I, <clears throat> when I was a Protestant, because I was raised Protestant, right? This was a big hangup for me because I thought, well, where do we get this idea of the papal states and all this kind of stuff? And uh, w one of the first Roman Catholic books I read was. Cardinal Gibbons book, Faith of Our Fathers. Um, and I did remember, I forgot I had this, so I dug it up. Um, this, I, I found a, an 1890s edition of this, which is pretty cool. So this is an 1890s Cardinal Gibbon. I don't know if it's a first edition or anything. It, it may or it may not be worth anything, but it's always really cool when you go in bookstores and you can find these like 1890s era books. But I, I did read this many years ago. I didn't read the 1890s copy. I had a, a separate print copy of it. And it was one of my first books I read <clears throat> learning about Catholicism uh, as a Calvinist. And uh, I will be, uh, I think that he actually had a, a pretty um, fair or what's the word I want to use? I think he gave uh, an admirable uh, defense of why the papacy became a geopolitical power. And so I will grant, to, I'm pretty sure that's right, right? I mean, it's been probably 20 years since I read this book, 19 years. Um, but I do remember there, there being like a chapter on the defense of the papal states. Let's see if that's in there. Yeah, here it is. Uh, I think it's chapter 12. But <clears throat> uh, I would guess, and I don't recall, but I would guess that given the fact that this was written in the uh, 1870s, that he was probably relying on documents that nowadays would be pretty much considered forgeries, right? Uh, I mean, I haven't, I'd have to look, go back and look and see what he what he argued. But in terms of the historical, setting aside the, the theological, the geopolitical historical uh, argument that he had was that with the collapse of Rome in the West and the barbarian invasions, right, that you have in uh, 400 or so, 410, whatever it is, um, you get a vacuum that the papacy filled. So because there was no longer really a state apparatus in the West to provide this sort of political unity to the people in the West, you got a papacy that sort of filled that vacuum. And it was a natural cultural center in the West. Rome is the patriarch of the West in the Orthodox view. But as we know, right, the, uh, the capital of the empire shifts to Byzantium a.k.a. Constantinople. So Byzantium becomes the imperial uh, seat, the center of the empire. And <clears throat> so we can grant and we can understand why the papacy uh, filled that vacuum and began to have uh, that that temporal power, um, which probably occurred from good motives. So I don't think that necessarily in, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh century, the popes were all evil. We have, we believe in, as Orthodox that many of those popes are saints as well. Um, but we do think that there, there can be the beginnings of problems in certain areas of the church, even, uh, even in the period or in the time when the church was united, right? So even for the first thousand years of the church, you can have creeping problems in the West, such as the idea that, <clears throat> uh, 
you know, that, that the papacy can become universal archbishop in some exclusive sense. And that's why we, w- we would refer to Pope St. Gregory the Great's letters um, about, I think it's John of Constantinople, right, where he says that if any, anyone claims to be universal bishop in this exclusionary sense, they are antichrist. So <clears throat> I understand he was a pope, um, and we believe that Gregory the di- Dialogist, a.k.a. Pope St. Gregory, is a saint. But we, ha- we also have Gregory saying in his letters that the Petrine Sea, right, is Rome, Antioch, and Alexandria. And you'll notice that after the first millennium, that, uh, that idea is abandoned. There's no idea in the, the, the second millennium <clears throat> that the, the, the chair of Peter is shared by three patriarchates. That's gone. And I don't know if Roman Catholics don't know that, right? But it's in <clears throat> it's in um, the letters of Gregory. And it shows us that the um, that the attitude uh, was not the Vatican one attitude, right? So it's letter here it is. To Pope Eulogius, <clears throat> Pope of Alexandria. So you understand that he's recognizing and calling the Patriarch of Alexandria Pope. That's an ancient title for not just uh, Peter in Rome, but also <clears throat> uh, Alexandria. And he notes that the chair of Peter, um, saying that himself now sits in the person of his successors. So here's Pope St. Gregory the Great explaining the notion of Petrine succession and that he does sit in the chair of his successors. Is this something relegated only to Rome? I indeed acknowledge myself to be unworthy, not only in the dignity of such a preside, uh, but even in the number of such a stand. But I gladly accept all that has been said in that he has spoken to me about Peter's chair who occupies Peter's chair and in and to him it is said by the voice of truth, to thee I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And also, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. And once more, Simon, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Wherefore, thou art, wherefore, though there are many apostles, yet with regard to the principality itself, the see of the prince of the apostles, Peter, has grown strong in authority, which in three places is the see of one. Does this sound at all like Satis Cognitum? Does it sound at all like Vatican I? For Peter himself exalted the sea in which he designed even to rest and preside. He himself adorned the sea to which he discipled his evangelist Alexandria. And he himself abolished, established the sea in which he was to leave and sat for seven years Antioch. So you'll notice this concession of Pope St. Gregory the Great in the letter to Pope Eulogius of Alexandria that all three seats are the seat of Peter. Have you ever heard a Roman Catholic apologist talk about this or mention this? Anyway, it's just something to keep in mind. And it's an easy demonstration that the attitude of the papacy at that time, right in the 700s, is not the Vatican I universal supremacy, autocratic, uh, unilateral view. And it's also not the idea that Peter has <clears throat> really doesn't have anything to do with Antioch or Alexandria. All right, <clears throat> so that's just one of the examples that, among many, right, that we we as Orthodox would point to to illustrate the fact that that runs completely counter to the idea that there's a special succession or that Peter's succession is only in Rome. All right, if you guys would hit like and share it. I would add, too, that uh, you can support the stream via the Super Chats. If you want to support this, you can Super Chat me here uh, at Streamlabs. That's what keeps us going. You can ask your questions as well. So this is where we get the Papal States, right? It arises out of this vacuum. And in the East, we have different concerns. We have different problems. Certainly, there are many problems, many heretics in the East. Many uh, heretics uh, in the patriarch of Constant, uh, the patriarch of Constantinople. There's, there's, there's not <laughs> just purists. There's, there's several. And you know, from the Orthodox vantage point, it makes sense that there would be 
heretic patriarchs because there's also heretic patriarchs everywhere or bishops everywhere can fall in heresy. Um, the, the Bishop of Rome in many cases was condemned and fell into heresy in the, in the first thousand years. Um, per, perhaps not as many times uh, as in the uh, West, I mean, excuse me, in, in Constantinople, but we grant all that. We grant that any patriarchate can fall into heresy. Um, and for us, that's an admission of the reality of history uh, and the reality of Vigilius, the reality of Honorius, and even later Roman Catholic views of the Middle Ages where, was it John the 22nd? Didn't, didn't he fall into a heresy for a time in the Roman Catholic view? So, <clears throat> so for us, you know, it's a different ecclesiology, as we said. <clears throat> but one thing that's in the, <clears throat> in the canons of the first thousand years, as I said, is this idea that you can't have prince bishops. And you can't have people from the church operating as operators of the state. And <clears throat> one thing that happened in the West that I did do a whole talk on many years ago or a couple years ago. Uh, we, we, we lectured all the way through Malcolm Lambert's book, medieval heresy. And that's an extremely scholarly text It's about, uh, five or 600 pages. And so if you want the boil down of that, it's a little dry, but I tried to, uh, comp, uh, you know, summarize it as best I could. Here is that video. If you want to go watch it, <clears throat> um, this is an important, book because it's extremely scholarly and it goes through the reason for the heresies in the medieval West. And there's many of them, right? Um, the beginning of, of heresy in the medieval Latin West is Bogomilism and, uh, in, in terms of the middle ages. Now there's earlier in my view, the heresy is already going on under the Franks. So, so for us, for the Orthodox view, Charlemagne and the Franks are a, a, a primary source of heresy and error. But after that period, you do get, <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, heresies like uh, Bogom Bogomilism, you get uh, the Waldensians, you get the spiritual Franciscans, you get the Joachimites, um, you get a lot of these uh, heresy arcs that, that rise up, um, many of whom are, are proto-communists. And the part of the reason, not whole, but part of the reason that they rise up is because of the opulence and the corruption in not just the papacy, but amongst Latin bishops, right, throughout the West. And part of the reason for that controversy was the what's called the investiture controversy, right? This is the idea that the, the king will appoint the bishops. And this becomes a huge controversy. And again, to be fair uh, to the Roman Catholics, part of the reason, I think, if we wanted to give a charitable interpretation, part of the reason that many uh, popes stepped forward to uh, further the idea of papal temporal power was perhaps to try to solve these problems, right? Perhaps to try to solve the investiture controversy. Because if we have state leaders appointing bishops, then you're going to have all these uh, rivalries and the bishops are going to be sub, you know, subject to the king. If you've never seen the movie Beckett, um, that's the point of that movie, right? Thomas Beckett is appointed by the king and he eventually becomes a true Christian. He really believes. And then uh, the king doesn't like that because he's not doing what the king wants. And so the king ends up killing him. He becomes a martyr. <laughs> that's an exa a movie Hollywood example of the investiture controversy, which is all, which is raging in the West. <clears throat> I am sorry that I'm, I'm sick. I can't help it guys. Um, but I did promise to do these streams, so I'm going to do it even if I'm sick. So anyway, um, good mode is notwithstanding. Perhaps there's still a radical change that many authors, many people note, uh, in the 10th and 11th and 12th centuries. And there's the chapter, if I recall, that's really good on this is let's see it's welton's chapter <clears throat> yeah here it is the, it begins on page 70 79 the crowning of charlemagne and the oath of pope hormizdus right this is when we start to get this real shift 
And we get what, what, what Welton identifies as a new doctrine. This is the idea that the Pope now crowns all world emperors and rulers. And the basis at this time, with, without any question, was the donation of Constantine. So the, the papal justification for why this is true and why this is what is the norm is the most famous forgery in the history of Christianity. Post modern day Roman Catholicism that has sort of grappled with this, especially since Vatican II, um, has sort of revised this, and now it's kind of seen as uh, something that evolves, right? So if you're a trad, you kind of have to figure out some way that this wasn't an evolution, right? Well, pretty much everybody in the world admits that the donation of Constantine was a forgery, but that was the basis for the for the formula of, of Hormizdus. And the idea, this new doctrine idea that the Pope can now crown all the world emperors. So you can, surely you can see, even if you're a Roman Catholic, why people in the Orthodox world would begin, would be skeptical, right? I mean, can you at least see that? Then we get this controversy of John VIII and the Filioque, right? <clears throat> and he notes correctly, Rome resisted the innovation of the change to the creed laid down by the seven ecumenical councils. As late as 879, Pope John VIII, through his legates at the Council of Constantinople, reaffirmed the traditional position <clears throat> to oppose the use of the filioque in the creed. Pope Leo III, while not uh, personally seeing anything wrong with the filioque, also forbade its use on grounds of the ecumenical councils had previously forbidden it. However, in violation of the Pope's commands, the filioque continued to be used in the court of Charlemagne, throughout the West. And what's really unfortunate is that it, Charlemagne used this as a geopolitical tool. Charlemagne started sending Western Latin missionaries into Bulgarian Orthodox territories. And he did that to convert them to the changed creed. Now, even if you're a Roman Catholic and you believe that the creed should have been changed, which in my view is ridiculous, and your own popes said that it shouldn't, just from the vantage point of causing problems in the church, you can see that this was a geopolitical motivation on the part of Charlemagne. Then we have, of course, the West <clears throat> sacking Constantinople notoriously in 1204. I think that what a bunch of people are burned because the West had hired all these uh, barbarians and whatnot to come and fight, right? And so it wasn't really a holy war or anything like that. It was, um, again this continuing problem and at this time leo the ninth uses the donation as his chief argument against michael serularius so you'll notice that in this period this crucial shift period the donation of constantine keeps being the main justification for the papal operations and why M michael serularius for example is is a bad guy and there was already an emperor. And so you'll notice that this idea that there needed to also be an emperor in the West that the Pope crowns is an affront to the existing Christian emperor. That's the point here. So do, do hopefully we can begin to see why this is such a problem, right? Now, the next chapter that's that's really key is, the, is chapter 5 in uh, Welton's book, which gets into the 11th century Gregorian reforms. Here's where the, pap the papacy really becomes a geopolitical power. <clears throat> the Gregorian reforms of the 11th century signal for the Western, Western Church a radical departure from the attitude of the seven ecumenical councils. And this is precisely what's admitted by Yves Congar, right? This ancient collegial structure is now re replaced in the West by a unilateral papal monarchy exercising authority that was highly centralized in the form of a church government. This ultimately controlled every aspect of church life. All the way down to the point of deposing kings, forming uh, geopolitical wartime alliances. If you've seen the Borgias, which is really good, um, Go watch the Jeremy Irons Borgias. I think it's like episode, what, four or five? And and Alexander the Sixth is like, if you don't come fight for me, uh, you're excommunicated. <laughs> I mean, literally like papal armies, right? 
So for 164 years, there was a Germanic control of the papacy. 21 of 25 popes were actually appointed during this period by the German crown. Now, wait a minute. Remember, part of the problem was investiture, right? Was the, the kings appointing bishops. And we're told on the part of many Roman Catholics that the papal states, the papacy is there to solve this problem. Right, because now if you have the Pope above the, the kings and above the emperors, then he can excommunicate the kings and emperors and it won't we won't have this problem. But now wait a minute. For one hundred and sixty four years, the papacy is literally controlled during this period by the German crown. In fact, Henry the three the third deposes several popes. So this argument of the, pa the, the, the East is Cicero Papist is not a very good argument, right? You're throwing stones in a glass house. And this goes back to the Frankish influence and control, right? Ultimately. Pope Leo IX is the first pope in history to uh, personally go to war. Leo the Ninth is uh, who institutes the notion of holy war and the idea of warrior monks. Do you understand that that had never existed? Now, you could have the emperor, the Christian emperor, defending the church as the as the head of the state, but for the church to go to war and proclaim holy war, this has never existed in Christianity. Pope Leo IX was the first pope to wage war personally. And when he conducted disastrous campaigns against the Normans, he ended with his being taken prisoner, as we saw in chapter 4. The spectacle of priests, bishops, and monks bearing arms and shields and swords covered in blood came as a shock to the Orthodox East. The Byzantine doctrine, uh, the Byzantine, typically Byzantine priests who took up arms against Arabs were deposed or excommunicated due to the violation of canon law. In fact, the very notion of warfare itself as, quote, holy war is something that, that arose particularly in the West. And this is where you get Benedict of Clairvaux beginning coming to the defense of this doctrine. Now, the next big step in uh, papal geopolitical power is, of course, Dictatus Pape. And I think there's some academic sources that do have um, Dictatus Pape online. So let's take a look at Dictatus Pape summary. <clears throat> and I think you'll notice if you're, you know, if you're not familiar with these topics, these are the dictates of, <clears throat> of the document Dictatus Pape. So I'll read a little bit of what he says. It was the claim of temporal power, which historian Arnold Toynbee called the great Hildebrandine error. This gave rise to the Gregorian revolution and its greatness, the papal Gregorian revolution. Um, it was precisely this claim that ultimately undermined the spiritual authority of the papacy that resulted in the great Western schism. You hear me guys? This is what leads to the papacy going to France for 70 or whatever years. On leaving uh, uh, and uh, leaving on the eve of the Protestant Reformation, a European people weary of the struggle between the Pope and the kings, they vowed to rule in their own respective kingdoms outside of interference. So in other words, a lot of this prepares for the Reformation. So a lot of people talk, like to think of the Reformation as primarily a theological thing, and there's there is a lot of theology involved in the Reformation. But I hate to break it to Protestants and Roman Catholics. A lot of the Reformation is also uh, Germanic kings supporting Luther and wanting to go to war and oppose the papacy. And while I agree that the Protestant Reformation was a revolt, um, they, they revolted due to the outrageous opulence and corruption in the papacy. And for example, if you watched uh, the Borgias, the TV show, if you watched season one, do you remember the? Do you remember Savonarola making an appearance? 
And why was Savonarola such a controversial figure in that time? Because he preached against usury and the out- outstanding corruption in the papacy, in the papacy's geopolitical temporal interference. So in other words, even people in the West, like Savonarola, recognize the problems that we're talking about. Now, I understand that those moral problems might not be the ultimate proof or defeater of the papacy per se. I understand that. Although I think it's a stronger argument to point out that all of this is a new development that is contrary to the canons of the first seven councils. To me, that's a, that's a pretty much a nail in the coffin argument. But even if you wanted to uh, set that aside and you wanted to argue that, well, you know, the, Re- the Reformation was still a, Re- uh, a revolt. Uh, the, there was a reason for it. And there were people who preceded the Reformation who had legitimate concern and legitimate critique in regard to corruption, in regard to the papacy going to war, in regard to the constant squabbles with the kings, because the papacy had declared this position of dictatus pape. So what were the dictates of dictatus pape? The Roman church alone is founded by God. The Roman pontiff alone can be called universal. He alone can depose or reinstate bishops. In a council, he alone passed a sentence. Now remember, when I asked Joe in the discussion, why would the Council of Constance be something that the three popes submit to? My point was to show, to show that the popes are willingly submitting to a council. Does that fit with Dictatus Pape? Among other things, we ought not to mention, uh, well, I'll skip down, uh, blah, 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 cannons, blah, blah, blah. The Pope alone might use the imperial insignia. You see that one? The Pope alone, all princes will kiss his feet. This name alone will be spoken in the churches. This is the only name in the world. It may be permitted for him to depose the emperors. He may be permitted to transfer all bishops if needed. So you'll notice that this is when we get this shift and now the Pope doesn't just run and control all the temporal leaders in the world whom he can excommunicate at will. He can now uh, depose and decide and determine the bishops in anywhere in the world. That had never existed before. Do you understand there's no canon in the first thousand years of the church that the Pope determines every bishop in the world. And it's obvious from a geopolitical standpoint that the papacy did that to make sure that all the bishops in the world are under the papacy. It's pretty obvious motivations. And do you understand that this is a radical innovation? Do you see anything like Dictatus Pape in the first thousand years of Christianity? Right? I'm not talking about honor given to Rome. I'm not talking about canonical privileges. Do you understand this is way, this is light years beyond that. And so that's why the Orthodox church says this is a huge radical innovation. This is light years beyond, you know, Peter is the first among equals. Peter is the Corpheus of the apostles. Okay. None of this is in the book of Acts. None of this is in Irenaeus. None of this is in Chalcedon. And you'll notice that what was the basis in Dictatus Pape? See that one? The decrees of Symmachus, St. Symmachus. Can you guess what that is? It's a forgery. The Symmachian forgeries. So again, we have to understand that the transformation of the Latin church in this time period into a geopolitical state power is over and over and over justified on the basis of universally admitted forgeries. This alone should be a strong enough argument. And this is why we do have to understand the geopolitical side of all this, right? In my view, this is a strong enough argument to refute that the papacy, as outlined at Vatican I and in Satis Cognitum, is an innovation and a radical change from the first thousand years of Christianity, especially from the canons of the first seven councils. Under Dictatus Pape, now <clears throat> there's a revolutionary order. Gregory the Seventh 
and these uh, uh, the later claims of Dictatus, uh, Dictatus Pape and the claims. And then, by the way, I think the last one is what? Infallibility. No, not the last one. 22. The Roman church has never erred. It will never err until eternity. The scriptures bear this witness. So here is the clear uh, dogma of indefectibility. Right? But even today's Roman Catholic apologists consistently admit that the Roman church has at times erred. Well, no, not when he was infallible. Does this say anything about only when infallible? It just says never errs. It never will err unto eternity. Now, as a Roman Catholic, I just want to ask you guys that are out there that are Roman, that are Roman Catholics, have, have any of the Roman Catholic apologists talked to you about Dictatus Pape? Have they gone into this? Have they responded to it? Have they explained it? I'm sure they have explanations. But have they talked to you about it? Do you know about it? Were you aware of this? Just curious. Because if you weren't, maybe it's something to look into. <clears throat> Around the same time, of course, canon law had largely integrated many of these forgeries into Western canon law. <clears throat> the forged documents included uh, the pseudo Isidorian decretals. It included the Samachian forgeries. It included the donation of Constantine. It included <clears throat> elements uh, that Dictatus Pape cites, right? And there's many other forgeries too that were very famous. And it's true that some of those forgeries weren't that big of a deal, but some of them were. And that's the key, that's the key point here. So while it's true that the forgeries issue itself doesn't necessarily refute <clears throat> every uh, uh, Roman Catholic apologetic claim about the papacy, it does refute <clears throat> and show that the papacy evolved to teach a new dogma, namely that every uh, you <clears throat> every king in the in the world had to be now in union with the Pope to be saved. So remember, it's not just Dictatus Pape, it's also Unum Sanctum, right? And this is another another document that they don't typically talk about because it's not very amenable to Vatican II in the <clears throat> ecumenism of Vatican II. And Dictatus, excuse me, Unum Sanctum of Pope Boniface VIII in 1302, which is during this uh, key period of, of transition and, and revolution. Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, and we define it absolute, absolutely necessary that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. And if you go and read Unum Sanctum, the subjection there is not just spiritual. It's, a, it's about temporal power too. So anybody who's not submitted to the temporal power of the Pope is damned. Do you understand the force of this? And do you understand that nowadays the Roman Catholic Church does not say this? The documents of Vatican II, which teach, which teach religious liberty, certainly do not say that all kings, rulers, and emperors must submit to the temporal authority of the Roman bishop to achieve salvation. But that is precisely what Unum Sanctum says. Now again, have the Roman Catholic apologists walked you through Dictatus Pape and Unum Sanctum? And have they give you a, given you a sufficient explanation as to why Vatican II and the popes after Vatican II no longer hold to this dogma, which previously was required for salvation, given the fact that now they admit religious liberty and do not teach that any king's presidents and rulers of the world must be subject to the temporal power of the Pope to be saved. I'm not talking about the spiritual authority of the Pope. I know that Rome still claims that Francis has spiritual authority. What I'm saying is that, do you understand that this is a dogma about you have to believe in the temporal authority and submit to it to be saved? This is not taught anymore. This is a change in dogma. And there are many more changes in dogma. Now, Roman Catholics say, well, it is still taught, and I reject the post-Vatican II teaching that it's not taught anymore. Okay, well, that's a different problem, and we've covered that at length in terms of the fact that you do have, have to believe and submit to Vatican II. It is a uh, dogmatic council, 
even though it says it didn't proclaim new dogmas, that doesn't mean it's not binding on you. That's the word games that a lot of traditional Catholics play that they don't have to accept Vatican II because it's a pastoral council. Okay, but there's four clarifications now from the papacy that you do have to believe Vatican II. And because it's called pastoral, that does not mean you don't have to believe it. That's been reaffirmed four times now. I thought this is an interesting point that stresses this. To appreciate all of this irony, one only has to read the letters of the popes to the Roman emperors to see how deferential they are. Certainly not the kind of letters that you would write to the grooms. So the donation of Constantine was a major attempt at a revision of history. Parts of it were included in most of the medieval collections of all canon law. Anselm's De Deus did it, Gratian's work, the Gratian decretals, in order to show that the Christian world, <clears throat> that Rome would always exercise universal, supreme, temporal, and spiritual jurisdiction. If you visit Rome today, you, you should visit the fortress monastery, the church of Quattro Coronati. This is perched on the, <clears throat> the Calian Hill. In the adjoining convent, there is an oratory of Pope St. Sylvester built in the Byzantine tradition where you find a series of frescoes that details the lives of the Emperor Constantine, Pope Sylvester. These frescoes are dated from 1246. One of these frescoes depicts the donation of Constantine. Here the Emperor is standing, handing, a seat, handing, handing to a seated Pope Sylvester his crown. This symbolizes the political power of the West, while... <clears throat> In his left hand, he holds the reins of the Pope's horse. From this famous forgery, the Reformed Papacy, talking about the, the Gregorian Reformed Papacy, adopted the rights of the trappings of everything to do with imperial state majesty. The symbol of temporal power, thus, is reflected in the, the document Dictatus Pape, number eight, that the Pope alone can use the imperial insignia. You see that? Bernard of Clairvaux denounced all of this imperial papism. <laughs> exactly. So even the people trying to defend this denounce a lot of this. Now, <clears throat> why is all this in, uh, relevant for today? Well, did you know that John Paul I was the first pope to not be received by coronation and I think to not use the triple crown. So in other words, the papal tiara, the triple crown. Did you know that, that that's what that signifies, right? And uh, if you're a traditional Catholic, traditional Catholics are have for many years been upset by this. This is a big deal to them. They want to bring back the papal tiara, the triple crown. Because the triple crown signifies the Pope's spiritual and temporal authority. And the fact that the Popes are no longer crowned with this shows that they don't believe this anymore. This is a change in doctrine, change in dogma. Because remember, it's dogma because the Unum Sanctum says you have to believe these things to be saved. <clears throat> this led uh, Pope Urban II to make outrageous uh, land claims. Like claims of... Um, vast territories just claiming them. I own these well, why do you own all these vast territories because of the donation of Constantine Pope Urban II in 1091 laid claim to Corsica Urban claimed that the Italian uh, uh, islands of Lipari for the papacy are also his because the donation of Constantine get, granted him the authority to say whatever he wanted with imperial authority so now this becomes a way to just land, it's a land grab it's a power grab and again, I understand that the modern papacy is modernist to a lot of traditional Catholics, but do you understand that that's a change? That's a change in doctrine. Lumen Gentium, Dignitatis Humanae, the documents of Vatican II that teach religious liberty 
are the night and day opposite of all of these things. Clearly. Anyway, he goes on to talk about and cite Father Dvornik's books, uh, which gets into some of this. John the 22nd, I think I'm right about that, right? He's the one that resigned. And that's why the Council of Constance is such a big, uh, a big deal for us because that's conciliarism. You have three people trying to be the Pope. And the papacy, remember, is supposed to be the final highest authority. Look at Dictatus Pape. Is there anything in Dictatus Pape that would lead you to think that a council will resolve the problems in Rome? In fact, Pope Martin, after this resolution, Pope Martin writes in intercunctus and intercunctus affirms that the council is the head. So here you even have the papacy admitting that the council is the real head here and not the papacy. Thus the papacy is a doctrine that consistently evolves. And as we said, uh, Part and parcel of the doctrine of the geopolitical power of the papacy as necessary for salvation is affirmed in Unum Sanctum. It's affirmed in the Council of Florence. It's affirmed in Cantate Domino. It's, in, it's affirmed in the Fourth Lateran Council. And it's affirmed in uh, Dictatus Pope. All right. So that's a <clears throat> good overview then of the medieval, the medieval issues. And I do want to speak a little bit too uh, as we were getting up into the Renaissance era because the Renaissance era is another uh, amazing insight, um, an amazing time period to understand for just how different the papacy is from the first thousand years of Christianity. And I'm not going to talk uh, totally about this book tonight, but oh, I did want to mention too that a couple things about the Franks, the Frankish papacy. So when a lot, a lot of Roman Catholics will take issue with the Frankish uh, thesis, as it's called, the Frankish stuff. But I just want to add, I just want to note that, you know, when Sashinsky wrote Filioque, he was Roman Catholic, right? When he wrote the history of Filioque doctrine. But Sashinsky concedes the point to us. And which he, I, as far as I know, he went, he ended up leaving Roman Catholicism and became Orthodox, right? It is the Frankish theologians in the court of Charlemagne who rejected Nicaea too. Now, eventually it's true that Nicaea too does... <clears throat> the, the papacy at that time affirmed Nicaea too, right? At the time of Charlemagne. But the Frankish papacy is the real root of one of these key phases of the papacy becoming a tool of, of state power. And the idea that the East is Cesaro Papist and the West is not, is not true. The, many of these popes, as we said, especially for two, uh, 160 years, were appointed and controlled by the German, the German throne. And so under the Frankish theologians, the, they're called the Carolinians, under the, the court of Charlemagne, many of, the, <clears throat> many of them, reje excuse me, Charlemagne rejected Nicaea too due to the court theologians, right? And Sashinsky goes on to note on pages 90, 91, 92. And this is in, re in relation to the councils of Frankfurt and Fertuli, 794 and 797. These are Frankish councils. This is where you begin to have the enforcement of Filioque. And, and this, again, remember at this time, it's, it's uh, rejected by the papacy. Right, both both Charlemagne's rejection of Nicaea two, Nicaea two is rejected by the papacy, and Charlemagne's enforcement of Filioque is at this time rejected by the papacy. And they sent for, Charlemagne sends missionaries into Orthodox territories to evangelize for the Filioque for geopolitical reasons. Thus, as Sashinsky notes, the old order of the Orthodox Imperium is now destroyed. 
And he notes that Charlemagne was never accepted as the Basileus of the Romans. The Romeoi are the Byzantines. Everybody at that time would have, if you had said, who's a Roman, they would have thought Byzantium. Byzant Byzantium is the Romeoi, literally. Who were the Catholics? The Byzantines. So literally the Roman and Catholic church is truly speaking the Byzantine church at this time. That's how it would have been understood. And thus after these, <clears throat> after Charlemagne, after those 790s councils, you have Charlemagne in 800, you have the Council of Aachen, and then you have Alcune of York, and you have the Franks pushing and enforcing a new creed and the the holy spirit as a as identified with the attribute of love and the rejection thus of energies right all of this is contrary to the seventh council you understand that energies is part of the seventh council this is all detailed and admitted um in pages 90 to 97 in the Filioque text from a person who was a Roman Catholic at the time. So that's another big concession again to our point, right? And I think <clears throat> Sashinsky, I mean, uh, Dvornik makes a lot of similar arguments too. All right, so let's look at this. <clears throat> now this is a, a book um, that talks about this. Who are the Romeoi? They were the Byzantines, right? And so I can't go through this whole book, but it's a good book. I recommend it. I'm going to put it in the chat here. Unfortunately, I don't think you can get this book in print. Um, let's try to remember the guy's name. It's a, it's a, it's a Greek author, but it just goes into the fact that, um, the Holy Roman empire is not Roman Catholicism, truly speaking. Roman and Catholic. Romeoi or Byzantines. Catholic, everybody in Byzantium thought they were Catholic. The true Roman Catholic Empire is Byzantium. That's the point. Not the Franks. And I wanted to point this out too in this other great essay by Father Dragas. That this is admitted to... in this classic essay. Orthodox scholar Richard Howe, in the study of the Trinitarian controversy between the East and the West, with special reference to the Filioque, stated that the sixth session of the Council of 879-880 had enormous bearings on triological controversy. He defended this by citing the discussion of the Horos, which is formulated at that time. How examine the particular nuances of this council in light of the subsequent writings of Photius relating to the Filioque controversy? Photius' letter to the Patriarch of Achillea and his mystagogy of the Holy Spirit both took the Horos as a rebuff against the Frankish, Frankish doctrine of the Filioque, which formed the theological background to the controversy to the Orthodox and the Westerns at that time. Had the Horos of 879-880 <clears throat> not had any theological import on the Philoque, then why does St. Photius refer to this issue in these two documents? Because a lot of times Roman Catholics say that it's not about the Philoque. Well, it is. So, And then it goes on to note there was no doubt that Photius opposed the addition of the Philoque in the Creed on dogmatic grounds. Right? So it wasn't just an ecclesiological argument. It was dogmatic. Anybody who's read the Mystagogy would know that, but in this famous encyclical to the Oriental Patriarchs, he complained, note this, this is from Photius's letters, that the Frankish missionaries were working in Bulgaria because they considered it theologically unacceptable. His whole argument is based on the conviction that the addition to the creed undermined the unity of God. We find the same reasoning in his mystagogy and in his letter to the Archbishop of Aquileia. Photius knew that the Roman Church had not approved at this time of the Frankish filioque. Because remember, the popes were still opposing Charlemagne about Filioque and the change of the creed. Hence, he agreed on the conciliar refusal of inserting it. 
He also knew that the Franks were striving to introduce a filioque into the creed <clears throat> on theological grounds, and they eventually did. There is no doubt that the Horos of the Phocian Synod officially disproved of the theological use of the filioque by the Frank, Frankish missionaries in Bulgaria. Told you. In other words, geopolitical motivations. By Charlemagne. Um... I don't know if we'll get to that. Maybe. All right. So I did want to say a little bit on the <clears throat> the uh, Renaissance papacy here. And one of the better books on this is, again, from a traditional Catholic. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the sources that I go to for a lot of these claims, because I think it's the best, best approach to this, uh, is not always from... Um, Orthodox apologists or scholars, right? I mean, we've cited one tonight, Welton, but uh, you know when when Sashensky wrote his book, he was Catholic, and uh, Hoffman's book written as a trad Catholic. As far as I know, he attends a Latin mass. I don't, I don't know if, if he still does or or what, but so. <clears throat> Uh, this is a unique text uh, coming from, as we said, a traditional Roman Catholic who doesn't, by his own admission, is not very familiar with the first thousand years of Christianity or the East. And yet in this book, what he does is he goes into the second millennium of Christianity, principally looking at um, the Renaissance and Rome. What's the relationship of the Church of Rome to the Renaissance? And Hoffman's thesis basically is that Today's ecumenism in the in the Roman Catholic Church does not uh, originate primarily from Freemasonry in the 1700s. Does not primarily originate from modernists in the time of Pius X, Pope Pius X. It doesn't originate from Vatican II's liberal approach or the ecumenism of Vatican II. His thesis is that the origins of syncretism and ecumenism actually go back to the Renaissance papacy. And, you know, for trads, this is, this is a hard pill to swallow, right? Because the trads are typically trying to find, uh, you know, the ideological predecessor to today's controversies. Is it the modernists like Tyrell, right? Is it the Jesuit modernists, liberation theologians? Is it Alta Vendita Freemasons? Uh, is it Protestant higher critics, right? And Hoffman goes into a lot of detail uh, in... I guess about 500 pages of not just looking at Renaissance papal praxis, but what, what was the papacy? What books were they having printed at this time? What artworks were they uh, patrons of? Right. What <clears throat> magical texts were being printed that they were supporting at this time? And I'm speaking here of the Renaissance occultists, right? the Renaissance magicians. And he, he critiques and notes that, you know, all of this sort of syncretism, which is really what's going on, uh, was present in, in Vatican II. It was present at this time. You had a, a people looking into the hermetic philosophy of Isis, the hermetic philosophy uh, of Janus. And in fact, there's even a, a giant artwork of, Isis in the papal apartment. And uh, I'll show you this. Now, I know we said we were going to be talking about geopolitical stuff, but this actually relates. So this is the Borgia apartment, I guess. So I guess this is Alexander. I want to see the ISIS. So he has a an ISIS. And I found this before online, but now I can't find it. Maybe it's this. Hmm. 
Hmm. Anyway, it does exist because we did a live stream um, a couple years ago where I found it. So I don't know why it's not coming up now, but the point is that you know the, the Renaissance popes had absolutely done this. Um, the papal worship of Isis in the late 15th century is uh, apart from the notion of Dulia. He's, this is Hoffman. He says that according to <clears throat> this is the idea of sort of uh, interpreting her as a kind of Mary, right? So this they would do this is they were doing the Pachamama stuff back then, right? Oh, Isis is really Mary, so we can get away with it, right? Uh, that's what he's talking about here on page twenty nine. He says the Renaissance popes were uh, conveying by means of the high art of the, the Italian masters, the seduct that were seductive because of their incomparable aesthetic. A symbolic continuity between the Egyptian notion of Isis and papal religious claims. A culmination of humanism, which was derived from Neoplatonic Hermeticism. Renaissance Rome's occultism was an Egyptianizing religion, for which Isis was the mistress of the word at, in the beginning. That's a quote. After the sorcery had taken sufficient and deep root, the Inquisition was uh, revived to maintain a stage play for the non-initiated who needed to believe that the post-Renaissance Church of Rome was in fact the bastion of anti-occultism and the pre-Renaissance Church as the pre-Renaissance Church had been. This hoax depended upon the psychology of self-deception uh, present throughout Catholicism. I mean, this is a trad writing this, I'm talking about the self-deception in the realm of traditional Catholicism. The elaborate theatricals themselves were in expendable small I don't know what he's talking about here. <clears throat> Expendable small fry were sacrificed for the sake of a public image. And then he goes into talking about uh, why, in other words, why they did this because they really thought that Christianity was essentially Neoplatonism. Right? The next chapter is about Janus. Um, and then he gets into Marsilio Ficino. And the Keys of Janus, which is a fascinating chapter. I'm not going to get read all that, go into all that. Um, but it's all just basically borrowed from Hermeticism. And the reason that this is important is that you understand that in Byzantium, Byzantium had banned Platonic academies. It has shut them down because the Seventh Council in the Synodicon rejects Neoplatonism. And it's Neoplatonism that leads to the churches being filled with naked people. And filling the churches with naked people is a rejection of the Seventh Council. During this time period, there was a change also um, in the uh, church's doctrine of usury. This is when the Roman Catholic Church now accepted usury. And this began with the Fuggers. The Fuggers uh, argued that usury was uh, actually okay. The papacy eventually accepts and changes the Roman Catholic position on usury. And by the way, um, Lofton and company interviewed this author about his book on usury, and they took it down because he argues that the papacy changes position on usury. So it's well known, shouldn't be disputed, but they did. Um, we don't, I'm not going to go through all this book, but <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, people that he goes through. Um, he goes through a lot of the names this time. He goes through a lot of the, um, individuals like Roiklin and that <clears throat> in some cases that there were people who converted like Johann Peppercorn and Johann Peppercorn actually called out and, and mentioned a lot of these abuses. If I recall, right, uh, and a lot of this printing of the Talmud, it was the papacy that that at one point um, was the patron of the printing of the of the Talmud. Uh, it's during this time period. This is also when we got a, get a lot of uh, conversos or Spanish converts, Spanish Jewish converts, Maranos conversos, um, who are Kabbalists, and so there is a popular theory during this time which is that 
Christianity is really just a version of perennialism. Perennial philosophy comes up on page 79. Hermes Trismegistus is uh, super popular at this time. And alchemy is super popular. And so this is the idea is that Christianity is the same thing as these things, right? Which they're not, but... Uh, and he... Uh, he goes into a lot of uh, discussion of this. The corpus, the Hermetic corpus, uh, is very popular at this time, especially in Rome and Italy. Um, this is why you have so many Renaissance magicians. And again, the point is that this is all supported and uh, given patronage by the papacy. Marsilio Ficino is a, big, a great example of this, uh, the promoter of Renaissance magic. Um, I was looking for the section on Reuchlin. Yeah, it's Marsilio Ficino who influences Pico della Mirandola, right? And all of this, by the way, is, uh, again, not acceptable in the East. So the Eastern Church had rejected all this stuff. And he goes into the prevalence of PEDO stuff uh, at this time. I'm not joking. So this was a, a serious problem as well. You think the PEDO stuff is something new in the Rome? In Rome, it's not. Uh, and Hoffman covers that on pages 484, 485. Uh, in fact, it was so bad that Rome, Peter Damien, St. Peter Damien, talked about how Skittles had basically gotten everywhere in the Roman church. So this is, this is a long historical problem there. Anyway, really good book. It's a, a long read. It's a very technical read. Giordano Bruno was a copy of Ficino. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, Giordano Bruno is uh, completely heterodox, right? So a lot of the he heresies that are popping up at this time, they're not just coming out of the domain of proto-protestantism right like the waldensians are proto-protestants the elizabethan uh renaissance renaissance uh is influenced by these people as well that's why in the elizabethan renaissance the there's so much occultism there as well so you can read uh you know uh, dame francis yates right her book on uh here a bug or something dame francis yates book occult about the uh, uh rosicrucian enlightenment right so rosicrucianism arises out of these same schools as well anyway <clears throat> i may i may do a separate stream on that down the road on just on the the, the renaissance era esoteric stuff it's pretty wild i've read a few books on that time period too so um i'm not an expert on that domain but i know it okay all right Next up, I want to move to <clears throat> more modern times. And uh, do I want to go to that? No, I don't want to go to that. Just to give context that <clears throat> I'm not um, unique in calling out these geopolitical problems. There is uh, an Orthodox bishop still around today in Greece, Metropolitan Seraphim of Piraeus. And when Francis was elected, he wrote a um, long letter, which basically is a kind of a, um, a, a little book. And he goes through uh, a lot of these same points that I'm making tonight, um, as well as many others. A lot of it is uh, theological points, right? But the uh, letter of Metropolitan Seraphim of Piraeus has a great section on geopolitical uh, problems such as the Vatican Bank. And I do want to get to that because the Vatican Bank ends up, unfortunately, um, intertwined with the global banking system. And it becomes a uh, um, well-known, famously tied to a lot of uh, international money laundering, a lot of organized crime. Um, there's a lot of books on this, very well-known. I'm looking for the section where he talks about this. <clears throat> and I do want to touch on that because people should know what's really going on in these, these institutions. 
That papism is a heresy is revealed by the appalling false doctrines that you confess. These are the political existence and structure of the Vatican with its ministries, bureaucracies, and banks. So that's the first thing that um, Metropolitan Seraphim of Piraeus mentions. And a lot of times Roman Catholics ask, you know, what are the, what's the full list of the things that would need to happen for uh, Roman Catholics and Orthodox to come back together? And typically, you know, we just kind of sum this up and saying, well, they need to convert to orthodoxy. But if we did want to make an actual list, this is a great list. And so he lists, I think, 30, 1, 30, no, 39, 30, 31. <clears throat> he lists 31 things that would have to change. These are the, the key 31 elements that orthodoxy cannot accept that is part and parcel that is the ethos of the Roman Catholic world. And, uh, I think, yeah, I agree pretty much with this whole list here. Right. I mean, but he mentions first this geopolitical problem. So I'm just pointing out that I'm not unique in this critique because Metropolitan Seraphim of Piraeus is very well known, famous, famous. Yeah. I'm going to get into the Banco d'Ambrosio in a second, but that's the first thing that he listens, right? Th th that he lists is the, uh, the temporal issue and the temporal issue is not just manifested in the history of, you know, Vatican machin uh, papal machinations to call wars, papal machinations for uh, assassinating world leaders. Yes, the papacy has been involved in that. I mean, if you watch the Borgias, right, it comes up throughout the series, which is loosely based on, you know, real stuff. It's also, um, and he, he, you're right, the possession of worldly and spiritual power by the Pope. That's the first, the fifth thing he lists, he lists. Uh, so if you guys want to read, and I do recommend reading this, I'll uh, put it in the chat for you. Much Paul's insert. We should do a stream just on that because that's a modern Orthodox Bishop laying out all the uh, issues that we would still have showing by the way, that modern Orthodox canonical bishops do still hold to tradition. And it shows that I'm not saying crazy stuff. And the, this last section, by the way, where he gets into this stuff, or it's not the last section, excuse me. It's it's actually early on. I thought that was at the end. Let's see. He even notes the geopolitical problems uh, relating to the Vatican Bank that appear to have been part of Benedict's resignation. The ink was barely dry on the dramatic, uh, dramatic announcement of Benedict XVI's resignation. Hardly had the tears dried on the faces when the first bomb was dropped, which in all probability was connected to this quiet resignation. In a report of special interest, which was brought to light by the Greek website, whatever, we read, German Pope abandons the Vatican and German banker arrives. Instrom Freiburg, 54-year-old, will take the reins of the bank with 6 billion euros and 44,000 secret accounts. 44,000 secret accounts in the Vatican Bank. This is a giant organized crime money laundering operation, amongst which is the pontiff's own private account. The taking over of the management of the Vatican Bank by the German banker uh, is expected on May 24th of 2012. After his predecessor, Ettore Gotti Tedeschi, was dismissed, during this <clears throat> this year, the Vatican Bank was left without a head. And if you get into the history of the Vatican Bank, again, it's nothing but 100% <clears throat> uh, organized crime and international money laundering schemes. And this is partly why John Paul I was probably, uh, this is probably why he was assassinated, right? So if you don't know, he died, what, 32, 33 days into being Pope? <laughs> And so I'm just pointing out that, you know, I'm not the only person to be aware of this. And I mean, I've been saying to you guys for a long time that, you know, the Vatican Bank had a, had a role in uh, why Benedict resigned. And also there was blackmail in relation to a lot of the PEDO stuff. I'm not talking about Benedict himself. I'm saying that um, these are the people that do the blackmail, these banking elites. Then he talks about um, the Roman church and the popes that supported uh, 
CIA Operation Condor, um, which was, uh, with the help of the USA, the CIA, to establish Latin American dictatorships. He talks about the papacy being involved in that. Um, the church was silent in terms of a lot of these scandals. So he mentions all these like geopolitical scandals that you hear me mentioning all the time. And he gets into Bergoglio's role uh, in some of this uh, uh, espionage as a, as a Jesuit. So we're not talking about low-level Protestant Jesuit conspiracy theories. We're talking about actual, right? The dictatorship in Argentina was erected then, this is during Bergoglio, under Kissinger, with his deputy for Latin America, William Rogers, who was gathered the, from declassified U.S. national security files released in 2006, that in Argentina there will be a lot of bloodshed. The CIA overturned the government of Perón using the uh, General Videla, who was convicted life sentence for crimes against humanity. They did not... <clears throat> They did this in the interest of Wall Street and with its support, and with the advice of David Rockefeller, who pressured the Argentinian Secretary of the Economy and his close friend, uh, Jose Alfred uh, Martinez de Jos, the lead Argentinian, into recession, poverty, and misery, surrendering the central bank and the monetary policy of the, of the, of the country into the hands of the golden boys of Wall Street and the International Monetary Fund. This kept the national currency purposely undervalued and created an extremely high international debt, which led the national economy of Argentina, rich in raw materials, into bankruptcy. David Rockefeller is well known as the founder of the museum in Tel Aviv that bears his name with the anti-Christian products that were shown in the television channel Sky during Great Holy Week. And he's also famous for the found, being the founder of the Trilateral Commission and <clears throat> being connected to the Bilderberg Group. This is Metropolitan Serum from Arpreus one of the most famous bishops in Greece telling you and talking to you exactly the way that I talk. So, <clears throat> yeah, and this gets pretty deep. That got, you know, that, that gets pretty deep into the uh, Latin South America operations of the CIA and the, the global elite. And um, this is, this is under the time period when Bergoglio is there. You understand? That's the point of this. And so he's calling attention to Bergoglio's um, previous uh, alignment and connections with the CIA. And so let's talk about that in the, what is the New York Times? <clears throat> LA Times article, Bergoglio's own statements have proved that the church dignitaries from the beginning knew that the Junta was torturing and murdering its citizens in spite of all the publicity publicly given to the dictators. The dictatorship could not have functioned in this way without crucial support. You were a conscientious supporter of the Junta, a man of the CIA, because you were not only compromised by papism and the Argentinian Junta, but you also refused to follow the example of the other papist bishops who stood up to the Juntas that were planted by the CIA and Wall Street in Latin America during that time. In contrast to your policy after the outbreak of the Chilean coup d'etat against the government of Allende, Cardinal Santiago Raul Silva Enriquez publicly condemned Pinochet's Junta the critical stance of papism in Chile against the Junta Pinochet played an important role in limiting the wave of political murders and human rights abuses. If you had followed the policy of Chilean papism, you could have saved the, the lives of many Argentinian dissidents. So notice that this is, again, this is not conspiracy theory. This is public geopolitical facts. You are not Francis of Assisi, the Pope of the Poor, but the Pope of the economic elite. You are the Pope of the ruthless, the ruthless Washington establishment and the Pope of those who believe in, I think he's talking about corporate fascism. And then he gets into Pinochet and the uh, WikiLeaks and the, the what came out, came out in WikiLeaks about Pinochet and uh, Bergoglio, this kind of stuff. Let us not forget how the uh, NASI criminals of the World War II found refuge in the dark halls of the Vatican and from there were helped by the fathers to escape to Latin America. A classic example of the war criminal uh, Ante Pavlich who murdered 800,000 Serbian Orthodox uh, with the Ustasia under the command of the false saint Aloysius Step uh, Stepanik. The tragedy is that some call this thing <clears throat> a church and one of the lungs of the church. Talk about based Orthodox Bishop. I mean, holy cow, dude. 
He sounds like sounds like Jay's analysis. <laughs> I mean, people mock what I talk about. The conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory. And here you have one of the most prominent bishops in Greece literally saying the stuff I say. So I would tell you that the people who call me conspiracy theorists uh, don't know what they're talking about, especially in the in the domain of the Orthodox world. They're just totally clueless. Uh, because, I mean, how about I just say this? Uh, okay, don't listen to me. Listen to what Metropolitan Seraphim of Prayer says. How's that? So you can bypass me. You can hate me all you want. Whatever. What about him? Next, let's look at this clip. Uh, actually, we should, before we get to the Banco d'Ambrosio, because that does tie into the P2 Lodge and Gladio, let's, look at, let's play a little clip from this interview with Paul Williams, who um, I'm not going to play all of it, just a clip of it. Paul Williams is the author of Operation Gladio, the unholy alliance between the Vatican, the CIA, and organized crime. And <clears throat> uh, uh, again, guys, Paul Williams is a Catholic professor and scholar. Okay, so it's not, this is not an Orthodox person. This is a Roman Catholic. So here's the full interview. If you guys want to go watch the full interview, we're just going to get a little taste of the beginning of it. And I'll link it to you. There's the full, you the Biden. <laughs> here's the, uh, the first few minutes is really relevant. <clears throat> and this is going to tie into, uh, so keep in mind what he says about Alan Dulles, what he says about, the stay behind units, James Jesus Angleton, and the uh, the twenty to fifty soldiers in every one of these stay behind units in terms of Gladio and what their job was. They recruited out of um, these P two lodges, these fascist lodges, these um, occult lodges that were also connected to organized crime. Is very very accurate. He he does his homework. And uh, there's no hate here. It, it, is, it is. Can you guys hear that? A riveting story of what had been going on and what is going on. So let's talk about it. Let's get it out there. So I'm glad you're on tonight, Paul. And, and I appreciate what you just said, by the way. Oh, thank you, George. Operation Gladio. Explain the title. Okay. Gladio is the name of a covert CIA operation that got underway to stop the spread of communism in Western Europe. And it ended up as an undertaking by the industrial military complex to create uh, the so-called New World Order. The name Gladio comes from Gladius. A Gladius was a short sword that was used by Roman gladiators to make a kill in the arena. And Operation Gladio, which once again got underway right at the end of World War II, has been responsible for millions of deaths, and it remains in full effect. When this started, how obsessed were they about communism? Oh, when that started in, uh, in 1945, they were incredibly obsessed with communism, uh, especially after the Yalta Conference. And they realized that the, uh, that the communists had uh, wanted Eastern Europe. They wanted Manchuria. They wanted to spread throughout the world that they had global, global aims that would not be uh, confined, and uh, that the threat of communism was even greater than the threat of, that came from the Third Reich. Uh, Alan Dulles came to that decision. He said, in, in 1945, we're fighting the wrong enemy. Well, he was right about that. Uh, and, of course, Dulles, of course, had his uh, differences with Kennedy, and, uh, eh, you know, his name's been kicked around a lot in the assassination. Yes. Uh, but for, for Gladio in, in 1945, uh, Dulles was a key figure. He started to meet with uh, people like Nazi General uh, Reinhold Galen and uh, Klaus Wolf, uh, SS Commander Klaus Wolf. And uh, with them, he started to set up stay behind units throughout Western Europe. Uh, uh, these units were equipped with uh, ammunition, with weapons, including uh, Kalashnikovs with explosives, uh, with highly sophisticated radio equipment, and they were set up to thwart uh, a, uh, a Soviet invasion if that occurred anywhere in Europe. Uh, all of these people, these state members of the state-behind units, were uh, either fascist or Nazis. 
they were trained by uh, they were trained by U.S. special forces, and they remained under U.S. command. Uh, yeah, we thought when the war after, ended, Paul, they all came home. Not so. Not so. The, the stay behind units remain there, and uh, once again, they, they 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 were set up in in, in Italy by. Uh, uh, OSS uh, Commander uh, James Jesus Angleton, and uh, by 1946, when the CIA was coming into for, into formation, there were there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these stay behind units throughout Western Europe, in, in, in including Turkey, and uh, they were uh, they were all each unit consisted of between 20 to 50 soldiers and they were all once again uh they they uh, they all had to be housed and cared for and provided for and it became a very very expensive undertaking how did you get interested in this how did this topic even make its way to you paul well i started researching as you know the 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 rise of radical islam right and i discovered that the cia had the cia had brought the most radical imams that we have in the country here, including blind sheikh Omar Rahman, who was responsible for the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center. Yeah. He was brought here with a CIA passport. I, I, then I became to realize that the huh. CIA had provided ongoing funding to the, many of the most radical mosques, mosques I had visited, like the uh, Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn, where the first cell of al-Qaeda was planted. They receive millions and millions of dollars a year from the CIA. And I was thinking, man, this stuff is crazy. It doesn't make any sense, I know. It doesn't make any sense. And then I realized that the CIA, and this was this was the topper, was the driving force behind the Fatullah Gul- Gulen movement uh, to create a new Islamic world order. And then I, th- it all led me to Gladio. And then I started poring over newly declassified documents from the uh Concerning Gladio from the uh, CIA from the, uh, that I obtained from the Freedom of Information Act, I started to uh, turn to some really incredible scholars and researchers who had written about Gladio, like uh, Alfred McCoy and Peter Dale Scott and Martin A. Lee and Sybil Edmonds, the most gagged woman in America. Uh, I realized I, I, then I became to uh, came to the realization that many people who probed into Gladio, many, I mean scores and scores and scores, met with a very untimely end, including Gary, uh, Gary Webb of San Jose Mercury News. Right. And uh, I finally came to realize that Gladio, that operation that, be, that, that was started by Dulles and these people in 1945 to ward off communism, came to involve not only radical Muslims, but also organized crime and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, because of that, and because of what happened that started in 1945, are we in the mess we're in today because of that? Yeah, I think we're totally in the mess we are today because of that. I think that this, you know, people would say, uh, when they hear when they hear this program, they might think, oh, this guy is just a conspiracy theorist. And by that, you, you, you're, you're like uh, relegated to the trash heap. Uh, I, I want you, everything that I wrote in my book and every everything that I, every allegation that I, that I make is footnoted with impeccable sources and CIA documents. There were over 2,000 footnotes in the book. And, uh, and therefore, that, I mean, this, I, I had to footnote it because the subject is so explosive. It concerns everything that's going on in, in America today, the, the loss of our sovereignty, the creation of a new world order, the, the rise of the Mujahideen, the situation that's taking place right now in Syria, what's taking place in the Ukraine, what's taking place in Central Asia. It's an undertaking. Gladio became an undertaking that became monstrous in, 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 in the, in the in, in the greatest ex- extent of, of that word, truly and truly and truly monstrous. All right, so let us look at this overall package. I want you to give us just an initial overview, Paul, because we're going to get into this. We're almost done. In depth. We're going to talk about the mafia, the CIA, and the Vatican. But give us an overview of this camaraderie between these organizations. Well, the, 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 the 
I'm right. It all started with this, it, with what we were just talking about. You had hundreds of stay-behind units uh, throughout, throughout Europe, hundreds of them, uh, in this operation called Gladio. They had to be funded. The money had to come from somewhere. And the, the, the resolution to that problem is what unites all these different uh, organizations into one nexus. The, the answer to the problem of the funding for the CIA and for corporate operations and for Gladio and the Stay Behind units came from a guy called Paul, uh, by the name of Paul E. Hellowell. Uh, I, I, I doubt if, uh, if nobody's if heard of him. Listeners have ever heard his name? Closest Paul they've come to e. the name is Hellowell. He served as the chief of special intelligence for the uh, Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, in China. In, in China at that time, right at the close of World War II, he was working with Chiang Kai-shek. And you got to realize there were two armies in, in China at that time. There was the, you know, Mao Zedong's Communist Army and Chiang Kai-shek's nas- National Army. Well, Chiang Kai-shek raised funds for his army by selling opiums, opium to addicts throughout China. And uh, to help Chiang, Hellowell established something called civil air transport. There, there was a, a fleet of, uh, of, 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 of aircraft, like C-47 Dakotas, mm-hmm. C-49 Commandos, and they trans- these planes transported opium from Burma to Shang's headquarters in southern China. And then after he was doing this for a while, Hellowell came up with what he thought was one hell of an idea. The new C- the CIA, the new agency that was being created in America, could raise millions and millions and millions for the stay-behind troops by selling opium, by selling heroin oh. to blacks in Harlem and other African-American communities. That was so their he, plan. That was the plan. That was the plan, and it's in the CIA documents. He said the blacks will be suckers for this. He said, look, at they're already went crazy at their, in, at, at, their, at their jazz clubs with marijuana, and smack will be a natural for them. He wow. said, we can just sell smack to the blacks in Harlem and other black communities at these jazz clubs, and it will, they, they, the white people will never touch this stuff because they're too affluent, they're too well off, they're too knowledgeable. They, will, they won't go near it. So it will never spread, spread to suburbia or to the white communities. And uh, he came up with this idea of selling heroin to the blacks. And Dulles and William Donovan, who was one of the founders of... Uh... All right, that's enough of that one. So you guys can go listen to that whole interview if you want to put it in the chat. And then we want to <clears throat> look a little bit at this one. Uh, let me see. I think it's this one. And I've got the audio up all the way. It's just this is what happens when you play a lot of these old clips. Sometimes the audio doesn't work that great. Flavio Carboni arrived in London. Carboni is a multi-millionaire, yet this trip, he chooses to stay in a crowded public housing compound near Heathrow Airport as a guest of one, William Morris, whom a reporter confronted in the lobby. What was Mr. Carboni staying with you at the time that Mr. Calvi was found dead? Oh, you know, I mean, I can't discuss any more of this problem. Why not? You don't want to know Is it true you're a Freemason, Mr. Morris? Oh, heck. Believe me, I'm not curious. Come on. You Can know, you tell us why it was that Mr. Carboni came to see you in London? He's a friend of mine, that's all. He's just a friend. But why did he come here rather than anywhere else? I have no idea. Ask Mr. Carboni. But how, how well did you know Mr. Carboni? A woman who introduces herself as Mrs. Coons approaches Calvi's daughter and hands her 50,000 Swiss francs with no explanation. My father uh, had uh, indicated in a phone call that uh, this Mrs. Coons was uh, going to call my sister in Zurich. And then uh, this Mrs. Uh, Coons appeared at uh, my sister's uh, hotel. And what did she say? She said she died. Yes. Over a week. A crisis meeting is summoned at the bank. The directors don't know where Calvi is and are informed by their auditors that 1.4 billion is missing from the accounts. They decide to fire Calvi from the presidency and call in the Bank of Italy. But in London, 
Even before the director's meeting, Calvi was beginning to act strangely. Certainly, that day, Calvi seemed depressed. He got dressed, undressed, took off his jacket and trousers, got in and out of bed, and whereas he'd usually have a rest every afternoon, that This is the Vatican Bank scandal, the famous uh, Banco d'Ambrogio and Roberto Calvi's murder. This is what ties into the P2 Lodge and Gladio. He did. Later that day, at the bank headquarters, just as the crisis meeting is finishing, Calvi's personal secretary leaps to her death from a fourth floor window, leaving a note cursing Calvi. We don't know whether anyone telephoned Calvi in Chelsea Cloisters to tell him either about his being fired or the apparent suicide. That day, for the first time in his adult life, Calvi shaves off his mustache. But still, he has not acted like a man about to kill himself. Sometime between 11.30 and 1 a.m. Guys, it's an old archive clip. I can't fix the sound. Go listen to the actual clip itself, right? Right there. And that night, Calvi leaves Chelsea Cloisters. To believe that he committed suicide, we must accept that he traveled over four miles to Blackfriars Bridge. And once there, found some scaffolding, which he could not see from the road. We must accept, too, that he happened to find several stray bricks, which he then put into his pants and in his pockets. We have to believe that somehow, past midnight, he found some convenient rope. And all this time, back in his room, he had enough... He was in search of a new government today for the 41st time since the end of... We'll go to the next clip. ...World War II. Government number 40, headed by Prime Minister Arnaldo Forlani, collapsed yesterday under the weight of a most unusual scandal. The revelation that nearly 1,000 of Italy's elite, including three cabinet members, were allegedly members of an outlawed, super-secret, super-evil Masonic lodge called P2. Today, Italian President... Son now, notice that this is mainline news in, in 1981. <laughs> mainline news in 1981. Now, why does this matter? Because the P2 Lodge is the Operation Gladio Connected Lodge. Pertini said he would call on a political leader tomorrow to form a new government, and all indications were that leader would again be Forlani. But it may not be quite that easy. Forlani is a member of the Christian Democrats, the party that has controlled the government for 36 years. But they have controlled through a coalition with the socialists and other parties. Will the others now allow the Christian Democrats to remain in charge? And what about the communists who have been chapping for a larger role in the government? And what is this thing called P2 anyhow? What, in short, is going on in Italy? It's the question we ask tonight. Robert McNeil is off. Charlene Hunter-Galt is in New York. Charlene? Jim, the mysterious thing called P2, also known as Propaganda du, D-U-E, was described by Italian magistrates as a state within a state. In addition to the three cabinet ministers, its reach extended to... This is the bank, the Vatican Bank. So I hope you guys understand. That's why I'm playing this. Two undersecretaries, 30 members of parliament, military officers, diplomats, magistrates, professors, and journalists. The problem was not that so many leading members of government belonged to a Masonic Lodge. It was that they belonged secretly. And in Italy, secret societies are illegal. What deepened suspicion about the group was the fact that the Grand Master of the Lodge was millionaire industrialist Licio Gelli. Mr. Gelli, currently a fugitive, has been implicated in a number of dubious activities, including the fake kidnapping of convicted financier Michael Sendana, who had attempted to avoid trial in New York by fleeing to Europe. It was this investigation which turned up the list of names that brought down the Italian government. For some more details on Italy's crisis, we go now to Rodolfo Broncoli, U.S. correspondent for La Repubblica, a left liberal Italian newspaper published in Rome and Milan. First, Mr. Bron Broncoli, what can you tell us about P2? Well, it's a secret lodge, as you have just stated, and there's nothing new, new actually, because it was well known that there was something, something uh, secret going on, and this P2 has entered uh, practically in every recent scandals, oil fraud, tax fraud, um, um, oil kickbacks, and also some more serious thing like... So anyway, the point is that this is what the Vatican is intertwined with. 
And uh, I understand that this, as a moral issue, doesn't necessarily disprove the religion. Are there corrupt bishops in the Orthodox Church? Sure. Uh, but the point is that this is different in, in the sense of this is essential to like the Vatican modus operandi, right, as a geopolitical world power. And for the most part, Orthodoxy is not a geopolitical world power. So, um, you know, if you want to research more into that, you can. Um, this also ties into the excellent documentary about William Colby, because Colby was stationed in Italy right around uh, when he was before he was CIA uh, the head of CIA. He was in Italy, um, presumably doing Gladio work as well. So I will put this documentary if you've never seen it into the chat. I highly recommend it. And um, we've been going for two hours, so. Uh, I'm getting a little tired. There's a couple more things. I'll, maybe I'll do a separate stream on this because I didn't get to it, but because um, I'm not feeling that great tonight. So uh, let's see. Super Chats. Do you plan to analyze uh, Cobra Commander? $5. Do you plan to analyze Arcane? There's a lot of overlap between magic and tech. Uh, I've not heard of that. I'll have to look at that. So let me write down Arcane. Thank you for that recommendation. Uh, Greek Roy for $3. Who's supposed to appoint bishops in orthodoxy? The emperor? No, it's done by the synod or the metropolitan. This metropolitan and the synod. So it's a church thing. It's nothing to do with the, sa the state. Uh, Andrew Hartsog, $3. I can't figure out how to contact you. If there's, a, there's a broken link in the archives. Okay, what's the broken link? The Oh, so the... Stoicism, Marcus Aurelius, uh, link. Okay, I'll fix that, uh, Andrew. Thank you so much. Anonymous, $3. Why would soldiers be excommunicated in the early church? Because soldiers are not bishops. When there are bishops that are warrior saints. No, there's, there's no bishop warrior saints. I don't know what you're talking about. A person might leave being a soldier and become a bishop and be a saint. And there might be warrior saints. But there's no bishop warrior saint, so I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, the, nothing nothing in what I argued had anything to do with whether you can be a soldier and be a Christian. So you misunderstood the point completely. Yeshin, 95, $3. Studying the eternal manifestation doctrine of the Filioque. The father is the arche, the son. The father is logically prior to the son ad intra. He's not just logically prior, he is the source in a literal sense. As for eternal manifestation, St. Gregory of Cyprus, does that mean the Son is logically prior to the Father at intra? No. I don't know what you're talking about. Why would the, the Son would never be logically prior? Oh, to the Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah, Basil says that the logical ordering of the Trinity is Father, Son, and Spirit. Logical ordering, correct. But the, the father isn't just a logical first. He's also literally this first, as in source and RK. Majoran, $10. If you heart correctly, if I heard you correctly, you're arguing the papacy was backing Neoplatonic movements and ideologies. Yeah, explicitly in the Renaissance, correct. Weren't Jesuits specifically tasked with tracking down heretics? Sure. But how does that, the, the Renaissance era magic promotion is prior to the existence of the Jesuits. Spires, $5. I designed you a free graphic overlay in this 80s aesthetic. Don't you, no, I don't know how to DM you the Dropbox link. You do amazing work. Um, you can just send me an email. So how's that? All right, thank you guys. If you would hit like and share, remember also the show sponsor is uh, chalk.com, the best uh, supplements that are out there. Um, we've gone for two and a half hours. I got a whole bunch more material. I have to save that for the next podcast. Um, so we'll do that next time. Uh, remember to head on over to chalk.com and buy those excellent supplements. They've got the She Legit, which is great for uh, mental clarity and focus. They've got the Daily, which is great for overall supplementation, uh, given the fact that our diets are all nutrient deficient. The Tonka Ali, I highly recommend for uh, boosting testosterone. It's peer-reviewed, proven to do that. And uh, there's also other products like the Action 2.0 to give you just that overall energy boost, especially if you're heading into the gym, if you're heading out to exercise. 
first thing in the morning. They also have chocolate, which is a great superfood addition to your daily smoothie regimen, if you do smoothies. Um, and they've also got other products like Irish Moss that's great for, you know, if you're a lady, you want to regulate those hormones. Go check out the Irish Moss and use the promo code J50. That's J-A-Y-5-0, J-A-Y-5-0. You get 50% off any of the products. And if you want to go ahead and do that recurring subscription, use the promo code J53LIFE. That's J53LIFE. In the upcoming streams this week, as I said, <clears throat> we're going to do one stream about the positive aspects of Thomism, positive aspects of uh, traditional Catholicism, to show that uh, this, you know, not it's not a uh, just a haters uh, exercise over here. So, um, I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to get to. If I got, we'll just have to do more streams because you know we, <clears throat> I'm, I don't have a lot of energy because I'm kind of sick, but. Um, we're still going to uh, power through. So if you would hit like and share, uh, there's definitely a lot more to get into that you could with Gladio and all that. So if you do want to get into that, I would say um, listen to the rest of this Paul Williams interview. It's a lot of great connections. He gets into Lucky Luciano and organized crime in the next section of that interview. So check that out. That's something that you've heard me talk about as well uh, quite a bit and um, fascinating stuff. Support the stream. Uh, you can go to the website. And in the shop, you can get my collected last 10 years of essays, 660 pages. All the essays on the, the polemics, the theology, the apologetics, the geopolitics, and the philosophy. Not all the geopolitical essays, but most of them. Some of them, I should say. So you can get signed copies of the Red Book. You can also get uh, signed copies of the classics, Esoteric Hollywood. You can also get signed copies of the uh, philosophy uh, introduction, the 15 essays book. Bert says for $5, thank you. Well, thank you, Bert. I'll be your Ernie. You be my Bert. Now, I'll tell you, I don't, actually, I think they're supposed to be Skittles, right? So I take that back. Uh, scratch that. Um, anyway, all right, you guys uh, have a good night. And uh, if you have some good links or some good resources on uh, Gladio, the Franks, Geopolitics, um, I've got some other books I haven't got to yet. Like, if you guys want more of this topic, um, I did lecture through, I think we did eight hours of lecturing through John Courtney Murray and his connections to geopolitics and the CIA in traditional catholic author david wimhoff's famous book which is which is excellent um and then i just got this one uh not too long ago uh from spies in the vatican this is a cold war stuff right so this is going to relate again to so i haven't read this one yet but i just got it john kohler i mean he's a, kind of a, writes on all this uh cold war stuff so he's coming obviously from a Western perspective. So, but I, I still we read those Western perspectives as well as non-Western perspectives. That's the best way to get the overall uh, picture, uh, appropriating the, the best, uh, clearest picture that we can, reading both sides of various conflicts. So, if you guys would hit like and share, and I'll talk to you soon.